Hello everyone. In this uh, session, I am going to talk about the visualization of uh, single variables, wherein uh, the primary focus for me are the different kinds of plots like histograms, density plots, box plots, where I am going to talk about what is the purpose of each of these charts, in which context we are going to plot each one of them, and take our example data and try to get into each of these plots. Wherein, agenda-wise, initially I am going to look at uh, what a histogram is, how do we plot histogram in R, how do we interpret it, what are the kind of uh, modifications I can do once I plot a simple chart, simple histogram in R. Then the similar kind of a logic I want to apply to box plot, which is uh, otherwise typically called as a Tukey box plot. Then the other important graph I am going to look at is the QQ plot, quantile quantile plot, which is one powerful tool to check normality in the data. So we also know the other way of checking the normality in the data is more or less checking if the skewness of the data is close to zero and the kurtosis of the data is also close to zero. And this can be uh, accomplished, this can be checked by using the describe command which is present in the psych package. But graphically, we can check for normality using a QQ plot. So we are going to look at that as well. Then two important functions I want to cover here which are more and more of an extensions of using your uh, apply kind of function. Here we, are, we can look at two major functions by and aggregate. But again, uh, if, I, if I really have to give a vote among these two, for the one that I use more and more often, it is the aggregate function. So I will be talking about the aggregate and finally I will be touch basing upon maps and how do I typically plot the maps as well. So these are the things, let's get started. So coming to the basic introductory aspect, when I look at the base R, there are a few plots that are available in the base R package itself. So whatever the things that I'm talking of today, majority of them will come from the base R package itself. But at a later point, when I'm trying to cover advanced visualizations, I would be looking at uh, various other packages. But there are, when it comes to R, R is a wonderful uh, charting tool. So there are a couple of packages which are exclusively dedicated for doing the charting and uh, graphing. We have a package called ggplot2 and we also have a package called lattice. So they are, there are different kinds of specialized plots that are optimized for a particular kind of data. So depending on whether my data is a, a categorical data or a quantitative data or within that, depending on whether it is discrete or continuous, we have different kinds of uh, charts that are available within R. Now, when I look at the graphs of R, we need to understand a few things. They are not, uh, they are not click and view kind of uh, graphs. You have to give different kinds of commands. So there is some level of programming that goes into it. In some cases, that programming looks very tedious compared to what we do with tools like Microsoft Excel and all. But we can produce phenomenal graphs through this activity. So there's a lot of trial and iteration. I do one graph. I try to make a lot of improvements to that graph. So some of, there is some kind of an effort that goes into it. But at the end of the day, it is worth putting that additional effort. So that's one point which I want to drive regarding the R graphs. So whenever you are trying to type your code, try always using an editor, especially when you are working with charts. Right? You can insert a new script and try typing the code into the new script itself because there is always a chance that you have to modify by adding 
one or two extra arguments to the functions. There, once you see that the different kinds of functions are added, different kinds of arguments are added, the function looks pretty long. So even if you want to do small kinds of variations, it's better that uh, you can make them in the editor and directly run them in the R part. So my suggestion is you can go with an editor if you are writing codes relating to the graphs. But at the same time, the good thing is it produces very high quality graphs, portable uh, to any other uh, external stuff on any operating system. They can be plotted and they can be made as much beautiful as possible. So initially, in this session, I would be looking at very basic kind of graphs. But as we move further, probably you can visualize some of the wonderful graphs uh, uh, when you start exploring R more and more detail. There's a lot of reuse. So once I prepare the chart, once I prepare the format for a particular kind of chart, I can very well reuse that chart, reuse that code even on different kinds of new data as well. So with this, let's get started with the histogram especially when you have a single continuous variable histogram is the default plot one single variable histogram looks like the most default plot and i can accomplish that using this uh, function hist 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 is a function that is typically uh, doing the histogram part so let's do uh, possible uh, from my data, we had the sales data, right? Uh, continuing with that uh, sales data or probably let me load the data again for your comfort level. So in this session, again, let me uh, read that read.csv wherein I'm getting that file, right? So let me uh, get this uh, uh, data. So this is the sales. So quickly, uh, let me uh, check the dim of sales to understand the rows and columns. Yes, 2080 rows and 10 columns are there. So now I want to plot the histogram of this. This is what has been instructed. I want to use the hist function. So I'll use the hist function. Probably from the sales, let's see what are the headings. So let me take the names of sales so that I'll see the headings and use them accordingly. So let's say I want to look at per the product one sales. I know that it's a histogram. I mean, it's a single continuous variable. So I'll take it as sales, name of the data frame, dollar P1 sales. That's the name of the column. So I'll put the name of the variable, name of the data frame, colon uh, or dollar, the name of the column. So there is a histogram that is plotted, a very quick way to plot the histogram, right? So this histogram, you are seeing some things. There are frequencies here, 0 to 600 and sales 100 to 250 are the numbers. So these are the kind of intervals. By default, R has chosen the intervals that needs to be plotted. So histogram is a very simple plot that is coming out. Of course, there is some kind of uh, a, a, a picturization that has been done, but there is a lot of beautification that really needs to happen. So if you look at it, the labels and all, okay, here it has given the label sales, P1 sales, and here it has taken frequency. So based on the variables that you have passed, it has created some kind of labels. So some kind of visual elements are not that great. So this is where I can improve on it. So either you can type in question mark hist and see what are the things that histogram can take. But some of the important variables I generally uh, look at, I'll put a main to put the main title to the graph. Xlab, Xlab equal to something which talks about the x-axis label. Ylab equal to something talks about the y-axis label breaks talks about number of bars here 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 columns are created by default but i want more number of columns 
so that the graph looks more and more uh, appealing. So in that case, I should I should go with uh, breaks. I can decide instead of ten breaks which are selected by default. I want to give instructions on how many breaks how many uh, breaks need to be selected. Then color. If I want a different kind of a color, I can very well provide the color as well. So by giving all these things, let me see how we can compute our histogram, how we can draw and improvise our histogram. So let me uh, try improvising it. Hist. So I'm taking sales dollar P1 sales. This is the name of the variable. But to this, okay, let me give a main. Main talks about what is the main heading, right? Probably uh, let me uh, call this as uh, product one, uh, product one sales and their frequencies. P1 sales and sales versus frequencies. So this is what I call as uh, the title. Main is the title. Here right now it is showing histogram of sales, this, this, this. So I am calling it as P1 sales versus frequencies. Then I will put a X lab, which is the X axis label. X axis label for me is uh, talking of P1 sales. Right? I am putting simple, uh, simple heading. Then I will put a Y axis label through Y lab. Y lab is frequency. Right. Then I also wanted to set breaks. So instead of 10 breaks, let's say I want 25 breaks. I can very well set it to 25. And color, probably the whole thing, I'll set it to a green color. So there are a lot of colors that are typically understood. I have to put the color in double quotes. There are a lot of uh, colors by default that are understood by R. So let's see what happens here. Now you are getting 25 different 25 different uh, breaks and the frequencies have come down because the number of groups have actually uh, gone up and uh, we are getting a slightly different kind of a graph that to highlight it in green color. So this is how I can set improvisation. If I really want to know what are all the built-in colors, right? Uh, color equal to, I give the English name. A lot of colors are understood. Very common colors are very well understood by R. And to typically know what are all the colors that are accepted or that are color names that I can give, I can simply do colors with an open bracket and a closed bracket. So all these kinds of colors are very well identified by R. I can give any of the names, probably you can see almost close to 657 uh, colors are being recognized by R. So any of these things I can very well provide as a part of my input in the color part. Then the other thing that I can see here, the Y axis automatically earlier we had it frequency up to 600, but now I am seeing it up to 300, which means the Y axis is automatically updating based on the frequency part. Now instead of frequency number, if I want the proportion part, that is where I can use one extra argument saying frequency equal to false. In that case, instead of count, I will get it in terms of percentages. Let us quickly see that. So one additional argument I can add to it saying frequency equal to false. Suddenly this graph becomes everything gets converted in terms of relative frequencies which is the proportion and the graph will be a plot of proportions rather than the actual value. So that kind of a change I can make to the chart. Then right now if you look at the x-axis Right, it is starting somewhere here, 100, so it is going up to here, but I want it right from the beginning till here. Now, this is where 
This is the default plotting of the x-axis. Now, the x-axis text, I can very well set it to none. So, how do I set it? I can pass one more extra argument, x-a-x-t, x-axis text. x-axis text, I can set it to none. None is capital N or small n. So, I'll one more along with it, I'll set x-axis text equal to n. The moment I do this, the, the text on the x-axis is typically going up. Now, I can set my own axis. Now, so this is the graph. If I want to set my own axis, it's not an argument, but I have it as a new line of code, which is axis. Axis side equal to margin. If I set 1, it means the x-axis. If I set 2, it will be the y-axis. And at, at is from where to where I want to set the typical values. This is what I have to give to the, to the code. So, I will set x at side equal to uh, 1 or uh, when I am setting side equal to 1, it is showing x-axis. So, I can very well uh, go with setting right from the beginning. So, I can uh, go with, uh, now I know these are the different kinds of, uh, these are the different kinds of values altogether. So, what is that I will set? First, I will set the axis. So, I will use the axis as a new function. One, this function will work only when the chart is already existing. So, I will use axis side equal to 1 saying that it is the rows and at I will set probably okay the minimum to the maximum. So, I will set it as at if I put I can put a sequence function. So, sequence from equal to 60 to equal to 300 and probably I will set by equal to 20. Right, so right from the beginning till the last, it sets these kind of values. So, what I could uh, see, okay, I think I need to close the bracket. The moment I do it, now you could see, this is the way the axis is being set right from the beginning. Right from the beginning, the axis is getting set 80, 100, 120, 140, etc. Right. Right. So, this is how the typical uh, axis is getting set. We can define our own uh, axis here. And at the same time, if I want one more additional line, right, I want a smooth line out here. Smooth line is actually coming through this function called density. Right, so let me simply take, without doing any kind of a plot, let me take what it is. Density of sales dollar P1 sales. So, the density gives these kind of stuff. Minimum, first quartile, median, mean. These are what are typically plotted. Similarly for Y. So, first quartile, the median, mean. These are the numbers that are typically computed. Now, I can have a simple plot of this as a line. So, when I have to plot a line on the top of this existing graph, I have to use this command called lines. This I have specified. Lines is a command which will add lines to the existing chart. So, I will say lines wherein I will do the plot of the density sales dollar P1 sales. So, I want to do the lines plot of it. If I want a color to it, right, in the lines also I can put, okay, color wise let me uh, put uh, blue or yellow. So, this is the color I wanted to put. Then, uh, the type. The type when I set it as L, it's the line that I have to plot. And uh, I can set the width of the line using LWD. So, if I am setting it to 2, 3 kind of stuff, 
different kinds of plots are going to come out. So I could see an yellow line and a cross which is showing more and more of a smooth kind of a line. Probably yellow is not looking that good. So I can put black or blue. I can call even uh, the dark version, dark blue. So that's a kind of a line that is typically coming out as a smooth line over the entire set of curve. So we can improvise the graph by using all these extensions. Right? Initially, I am having only the simple skeleton histogram. But slowly, we were able to modify this histogram by uh, adding uh, different kinds of arguments. And along with that, we added, uh, we, we were able to work with the axis part. Right? You can experiment. Now, y-axis also, you want to change to something. You can experiment. And similarly, uh, using the lines also, we are able to draw a kind of smooth line across. Right? So, this entire thing goes as a part of the understanding of the histogram. Rest all, you can very well experiment on your own. Then, I am moving to the second important type of chart. where I am going to cover the box plot, otherwise called as a Q-key box plot as well. If I want to represent a distribution of the data, this is the one major, one major source of chart. So we can accomplish this using the box plot kind of a command. So the same logic, again, this is for continuous data as well. So I will put it as box plot sales dollar p1 sales so there's a box plot by default i'll get this box plot in the vertical direction but if i want it in the horizontal direction i just need to add one more uh, one more uh, uh, parameter here saying horizontal equal to true if i say horizontal equal to true the same graph would be shown to us in the horizontal direction. Now, I can add even the titles and all that stuff. We have already discussed about it just for a practice. Main equal to, so I'll call it as box plot of P1 sales. Right, I can call it box plot of P1 sales and probably if required color also, I can put it as green. All these just for a practice I am doing it. So this chart would be uh, plotted with a green color, colored with a green color. So if required I can give what is there on the y on the x axis here. It is the P1 sales quantity itself. So I can very well mention the axis labels and all which are more or less in a similar way. Now this typically presents the distribution of the data more and more compactly than a histogram. If I have to analyze this, this center line, the dark center line here, it is the median. So I could very well make out the median is somewhere in this 130 kind of a range. Then this is what we call as Q1, which is the first quantile. This is what we call as Q3, which is the third quantile. So in any typical uh, box plot, which is coming like this. This is the box. There is a median here. Then we have two whiskers out here. And here we are talking of different kinds of circles out like this. This is how typically the shape is looking out here. Now this is what we are calling as the median, the center line. So this is the 25th percentile data value. This is the 75th percentile data value. Now, these are typically called as whiskers. The outer lines are the whiskers, which are nothing but the way it is computed is Q1 minus 1.5 times the interquartile range. Interquartile range is Q3 minus Q1. Similarly, this R, the minimum value whichever is 
whichever is the lowest that would be represented here. Similarly, when it comes to this, Q1, Q3 plus 1.5 times Q3 minus Q1. Again, whichever is the lowest. Right? Or here, whichever is the highest. That is what is going to be represented. Here, whichever is the lowest, that is what would be represented. So, either it could be a Q3 plus 1.5 times Q3 minus Q1 or the maximum. Okay, whichever is the lowest that would be represented here, whichever is the highest that would be represented here. And any other values that are beyond that, either this side or this side, we are calling them as outliers. So, points beyond the viscous are outliers and they are shown as circles. So, here we could see that there are so many outliers towards the higher side with respect to P1, right? The same way I may have to look at even with P2. So, box plot is a very, very useful kind of a uh, representation, especially when I am looking at the distribution of the data. And if I want to look at the distribution by some factor, now, here, I have looked at the distribution of overall P1 sales. But let's say my objective is look at the P1 sales by country. For each country, I want a separate distribution for the sales. If that is the kind of objective I am carrying, then... I can very well look at using the box plot wherein for each country I will get a separate box plot. So that becomes much more advantageous when I am using the box plot. So a very very useful thing when I have to compare the distributions based on some factor. Here the factor I am talking of is country wise. And the best way I can do that is I have to specify a response formula. So, when I say response formula, I want to compare P1 sales by country. So, by country, I am giving it with a tilde notation. So, P1 sales, I call it as a response, a response variable and country is what I am calling as the explanatory variable. So, let me try this out, right? And, uh, okay, let's try box plot. This time, not for the whole data, I want to break this box plot by, by uh, country. So, I am taking box plot, wherein I am taking sales dollar P1 sales till day. This is my till day operator. I am looking at sales dollar what is the variable for country? Let me just check the heading for country. It is country all small letters. Okay. Country. So this is the box plot I want. Sales dollar P1 sales. Till date sales dollar country. So I'll try to have it uh, horizontally itself. So, that's where I'll set horizontal equal to true. Then I also want to put, so whatever is the axis. So, uh, if I want to, uh, if I want to give a title to it, main is country wise distribution of P1 sales. This is what I'm calling as my main. Then I can give my X axis. So I'll give the X label as P1 sales. Right. And uh, I'll put. Uh, I, uh, I may not want. Uh, let's see. Uh, for this time being. If I want a Y label. Right. First let me uh, plot up to here. Based on that let's see what all we have to. Uh, Improvise to this chart. Okay, so it has given something like this. 
for australia this is what it is for brazil this is what it is for china this is what it is and for all the seven countries this is how the things are going now if i am fine with this i can go ahead with this but if i say i don't want the axis in this way i can very well replace the axis if i don't want the axis uh, to come up in this particular way i can very well uh, uh, very well remove the axis but let's say the y axis instead of just showing in this vertical direction if i want it in the horizontal direction i'll set it as las las equal to 1 if i am setting the text instead of being horizontal instead of being vertical it would be shown more and more horizontal then y axis labels fine australia brazil so it's showing me the uh, the notations as they are so i can very well keep the things like this now i could very well see in case of australia probably there are only two or three outliers whereas in case of brazil the number of outliers is much higher china is having very few us is having very few but denmark is having probably very big outlier here so some such kind of analysis and even if i am looking at uh, the median looks like australia is having slightly the highest median and china is slightly on the lowest and you look at the box size which is the interquartile range it looks like brazil is having a very thin box so some such kind of uh, understandings we can very well make by looking at this particular uh, box plot so you can make it uh, again the colorings lot of things you can very well do just by looking at the structure of this chart so that's one more thing then moving on to the next part now that we got a basic idea of the box plot i want to move towards qq plot the major objective of the qq plot is to check the normality of the data right or for that matter data versus a distribution so the distribution i may think of it as a binomial distribution or a poisson distribution or a normal there are hundreds of distributions like this that are there so i want to check how close is my data to a particular distribution is my data following a kind of a uh, kind of a distribution that i am expecting or not in that case i can very well go with a q q so it would be plotting the observed quantiles versus so what what would be the quantiles in case the data is following the distribution that you are expecting so the actual data what are the quantiles of it versus assuming that your data is following the distribution you expected what what should be the quantiles corresponding to that so this is the plot so there could be a actuals actual quantiles and expected quantiles so if if your actual and expected are more or less meeting your line your graph should be more or less like a straight line which is a kind of a 45 degree line actual quantiles and expected quantiles should be more or less similar and why do we really need to do these kind of analysis because many times whatever are the statistical tests that we are going to perform at a later point we need to understand different statistical tests are making different kinds of assumptions regarding the distribution of the data so some of them are assuming that your data has to be normally distributed so if that is the case especially if i have to use a t test or if i have to do some kind of pearson correlation various such kind of analysis that i am going to do later they all assume that my data is very close to normal so i really have to check whether they my data is anywhere close to normal so this is where i'll use this function called qq norm qq norm will check will will show visually whether my data is anywhere close to normal so let's see i'll use this function qq norm sales dollar p1 sales so which is telling me no it's not looking like a straight line probably if required 
I can plot a straight line as well. So I will take a QQ line for the same. Sales dollar P1 sales. I can take a QQ line which says if at all it is following a kind of normal distribution, all these points should be more closer to this line. Here a lot of points are much above the line. Here also a lot of points are much below the line. All right, much above the line. So in both the sides, majority of the points are much above the line. Right. So this is what is an indication that this particular data is not following any kind of normal. But in some cases, what people will try is if some kind of transformation of the data, let's say I try not the sales directly, but I take the logarithm of the sales instead of taking the sales. I take the logarithm of the sales to really check if this is following any kind of a normal distribution. Looks like there is a straight line altogether. Right? If required, I can also go with QQ line to see what is the line looking like here. The QQ line is showing something more or less matching. Very few values are above here and couple of values are below here. But looks like when I am trying to compare between the earlier graph versus this graph, looks like logarithm of the P1 sales is more and more normal compared to the original P1 sales as such. So even such kind of understanding uh, will make, uh, so it's better if I have to do a correlation or do a kind of a t-test at a later point regarding the P1 sales. I prefer using the log P1 sales rather than the original P1 sales as such. So QQ line is adding a diagonal. We have already added that. So if it is the points are far from the line, then it is saying that the data is not normally distributed. But if the curve is more and more upward, in this case, lot of these points are up. So the curve is more and more upward. It's a very good indication of the positive skewness. And the curve is more and more downward. It indicates a lot of negative skewness present in the data. So this is one more uh, quick way to check out whether the data is close to normal or much away from normal. And even if it is much away from normal, is it more and more positively skewed or is it more and more negatively skewed? All right. Then moving on to the next aspect where I'm trying to cover the usage of two important functions. And even out of this, I prefer more of the using aggregate itself. There is nothing that uh, aggregate can't do which buy can do. But just for the sake of understanding, we are understanding the buy. But aggregate is a very powerful function. So basically, it's like I'm breaking out the data by factors. So if I want to uh, do a country level summary, right, country level calculations in one single go, I can go with the aggregate and buy. Instead of doing it on the overall data, I want to do it based on some factor. Factor is nothing but a categorical variable. So I'm summarizing by a factor within the data itself here. So either I can use the by function, wherein first I have to give what is the name of my data, right? What are the indices that I'm going to use? Means on what basis the grouping is going to happen? And what is the name of the function I want to go with? So these are the three things that I'm trying to give. So let's see how we can do it. So I'll do a buy. I'll do a buy. So the data that I want is sales dollar P1 sales. That's the data for which I want to do the analysis. Then the grouping. The grouping that I'm trying to do for that it is indices. So I can group uh, a direct one single or if I want multiple groups, I can use list. So for time being, let me give only one single. 
so it is sales dollar country so i want to do a grouping by country and i want to take the mean right for each country so i'll get a simple tabular description saying for australia the average sales is 139 for brazil it's 133 131 132 131 so probably it looks like australia is having slightly more average sales compared to the rest so this is how the buy is trying to provide and if i want to let's say say country as well as uh, right whether the promotion is done or not so that's where i have to put it as a list because i want to take both of them so one i'll take it as country and the second one i'll put it as p1 prop which is the p1 promotion being done or not then i am getting a slightly uh, a very complex table this is where i generally don't prefer using buy because it's uh, it's giving giving the information in this form okay au australia when no promotion is done 132 brazil when no promotion is done 129 china or canada when no promotion is done 125 and so on and once you come here again there is uh, the next information saying okay australia when promotion is done it is 175 brazil it's 162 so you'll get a kind of a data like this which is more and more irritating because you have to scroll through the stuff a lot so that is one major drawback right we are grouping it by more than one factor we have used a list but the result is not structured as we have seen here but the same thing I can very well accomplish using the aggregate as well. So this aggregate will simplify my understanding exactly in the same way, but the presentation is much better. So the input wise, I have to say aggregate x equal to whatever is the data, by whatever is the function that I'm more interested, uh, sorry, by is uh, whatever is the grouping that I'm going to do, which is country here function i can use mean or whatever so i'll use aggregate right and uh, i'll say sales dollar p1 sales then buy i'll have to do it as uh, buy here i'm taking it as sales dollar uh, country and then I am doing the function is mean. Okay, buy must be a list. Okay, so if I am specifying buy, I have to put this in a list. Let me put it in a list. So here it is giving a very clear presentation, the same detail, but because this I can even assign it right probably uh, i can say i can assign this to a variable saying p1 country sales p1 dot country dot sales so i'll put for each country so i'll assign it to a variable p1 p1 country sales so if i want to use it at a later point it becomes quite useful for me if i want to extract something because it gives me in the form of a data frame so that's one more advantage that we can derive using the aggregate function instead of using the by kind of a function. All right. Then the other thing that is more and more helpful for us, but of course, uh, uh, we have to dig in more and more detail here. I'm just giving a very uh, base level overview of the usage of maps. So one of the most common kind of maps that we generally use is a Coropleth map. So basically we have a map, world map or some such kind of a country map, regional maps. And based on that, I'll use different kinds of graphics or colors to indicate the values of the variable. So different colors to indicate uh, the intensity of the value of the variable. That I can very well execute through a function through a package called R World Map. I can download that package, I can install that package, and I can load it. So it's already installed in my system. 
so i'll just use a library to load that package our world map so i'll get this package our world map within that i'm trying to use this function join country data to map so this is where we have countries so i want to do the plotting country wise right so this is what i want to do join the country data to map so what is that i want to do i'll create a new variable right p1 uh, country map instead of sales i'll call it like p1 dot country dot map and uh, this variable i'll create using join country data to map so i'll use the uh, function join country data to map now if you want to see what it typically contains the first thing is based on what you want to do the mapping so i will go with this i'll go with this aggregate whatever we have got country data and uh, sales i'll typically use this to do the plotting right so this is where i'll say i'll use this p1 country sales that is what i'll use it as an input based on that so this is the kind of a data that i am providing to it so you do the join country data to map based on this particular uh, based on this particular data frame then i have to give join code on what basis you have to do the joining so we have different kinds of basis there i'll show you how to get it but iso2 when i am saying it means it's the two digit country codes that are already there so that two digit country code join code has to be capital c so i have to give a two digit country code iso2 when i am saying it's a two digit country code so au will be mapped to australia br will be mapped to brazil and so on so that's a two digit country codes so that is what we call as iso2 then another important variable that i have to give is name join column so which column name i have to match so we know that i have to match within this particular data i want to match this particular uh, column name called group.1 that is the name of the column that i want to match so let me call it as group.1 so this is what i wanted to do so i get a new variable so it is saying seven codes from your data successfully match the countries in the map so probably if i type p1.country.map to see what it is giving so it is doing some kind of an allotment right you see a lot of things coming up all this is what going as a part of that map object right it is taking uh, the latitude longitude coordinate so there is a lot of thing that has gone into that uh, our world map package so we are getting all these information as a part of the moment we are doing the country data to the map joining and once we know that our uh, our, our map object is this is a map object once our map object is created then i can do uh, then i can actually do the plotting of the map so for that i'll use a function called map country data this is a function that i will use wherein i'll take p1.country.map which is my map object so i'll take that p1.country.map and what name column to plot so name column to plot we have already uh, used which column to plot so i'll take that variable name what has to be plotted i think it's x x was the name of our variable that needs to be plotted so which is nothing but which has taken the uh, which has taken the average so i'll plot it x now what i could clearly see is a, a country map is created here right i could see here this is a world map so towards this versus this the dark red is suggesting australia here here china is looking somewhat uh, uh, somewhere here right but prominent wise china is looking more prominent though its values are much lesser this is where the coropleth map has its own set of limitations 
Some countries look very, very popular because of their area, not because of the value. Now, this is what is the kind of an argument that is existing with respect to Coropleth map and where it is uh, majorly discouraged for major aspects. But let's see some more things. The join code, right, we have talked about ISO 2 is a two letter country name. The name join column is the column name for which the matching has to be picked. I have already talked about it. So once the map object is created using join country data to map, then we are actually doing the mapping of the country data where we are trying to plot the resulting map. So which value has to be plotted? So that is what is being attached using the name column to plot. So that is what has created the overall Coropleth map for us. And we see that it is more and more problematic because the geographic area is compared with the scaled quantity. So, uh, so this is where we have to be slightly careful when we are doing the interpretation of the Coropleth map. And when you are uh, starting to explore, look at the R world map package altogether. There are different kinds of options in that package. I can look at drawing different kinds of regional maps. I can go for more and more granular areas. Different kinds of color palettes can be set. So a lot of things can very well be done. So uh, right now you can very well explore more and more deeper into the understanding of the R world map package which can do a lots of maps plotting for us. So this is what I really wanted uh, you to understand as a part of this particular session. So we have focused more on histogram, box plots, QQ plot to check normality and using of by and aggregate functions and finally had a small discussion on maps as well. So I hope you got uh, clarity in the usage of all these functions. If you have any further queries regarding the same, you can very well get back to me by giving me a call on the number that I have provided below or you can even send in an email at momsidhar at the rate of pacegurus.com. Thanks a lot for listening to this uh, session. Thank you very much.